We are pleased to have Pastor Andre and his wife Marina here in our studio. Pastor Andre is the Ukraine Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Director and a pastor in Kyiv, Ukraine. He has been here in the United States for several weeks. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us. It's our pleasure to be here. <laughs> Let's quickly just go right into your story and explain to me, of course, everybody who's watching understands about what is happening in Ukraine, but here we have firsthand, you're gonna hear some information firsthand from a person of faith who can tell you what happened to him and what has happened to those around him. Let's jump back to February 24th. What happened on February 24th? Uh, so on February 24th, uh, we woke up in the middle of the night. Uh, actually, it was my wife who woke up first, and uh, she kind of pushed me to the side and said, uh, wake up, we've been attacked by mm. Russia. And uh, I was half awake, half asleep, and, uh, and so of course, 4.30 in the morning, and I'm saying, go back to sleep because you're dreaming. Mm. And she is, no, look at the news, look at what the social media is saying, we've been attacked. Uh, every major city of Ukraine has been attacked by Russia. And uh, so I, uh, I got up and we live in a tall building on the eighth floor or the 25th floor building. We have, I don't know, th thousand people probably living in our house and then thousands of people living in all these other houses. It's a very uh, crowded area. And I'm looking down uh, uh, from the eighth floor what's happening from the window and there's all my neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going out with all the bags and possessions and children and uh, elderly and uh, cats and dogs. And they're just putting stuff in the cars and they're getting ready to live. And we're just standing there not, not understanding what to do, how to react. Because although we've heard rumors about the war beginning, mm -hmm. but we were not emotionally prepared. We were not prepared that something like this radical would actually take place in the 21st century. Mm. Of course, we here in the United States, we're also hearing that. We were reading the reports of, of, of Russia threatening, but also wondering, would it actually happen? So here you were in a situation and people were just leaving, just immediately just going. Mm -hmm. right away just going no uh, we had people uh, like we live in the area and typically people go to work and so sometimes we would see traffic jams in front of our apartment eight o'clock in the morning nine o'clock in the morning till 10 until everybody uh, leaves from our sleeping neighborhood or um, the place uh, kind of a remote site and then everybody travels uh, to the center city uh, for work but then we for the first time we've seen the traffic jam started to build up at five o'clock in the morning mm. and there is all these cars of people trying to get out you know and then we're talking to our friends and neighbors and they're a lot of them are getting out and some of them are stuck in the traffic and for some of them it took like four hours just to get to the edge of the city i mean i'm not talking mm -hmm. about traveling even to the border or some mm. of the western towns uh which for some people it took them a week to get there because there are so many people evacuating so many people running for their life so what did you do what do you do you and your wife do at that point uh we uh, we were uh we didn't do anything. <laughs> Actually, I mean, we decided to stay. We thought, okay, that, uh, because you don't know. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, during a time of war, the most difficult thing is that you don't know what is about to happen. You don't have a schedule. Like uh, Russia didn't send us the uh, email <laughs> saying, this is the agenda for the next four or five months. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna attack this city here, or we we're gonna bomb this. We shouldn't laugh about it, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I, I, yeah. But, you don't know, so you, you, you kind of expect something, but you don't really know what to expect. So we decided to stay in our own apartment for another night. And then the next night we woke up again at about the same time, 4.30 in the morning. So our military this time, they shoot a drone, uh, which was above the Kiev city, and it was shot right above our house. So we woke up 4.30 in the morning, same, same time, you know, middle of the night, explosion again. And I see something like, that, it looked like uh, fireworks, but typically fireworks go out. You know, yeah. this, is, this was like the fireworks or the rain of fire coming towards us into our w windows. And then we later learned that some pieces from that explosion landed on another house and there was another nine story building that just burned within a matter of a couple of hours and, wow. and fire uh, fire guys and emergency service they were not even able to to deal with it because like i said no one was prepared for this yes uh, it was a full-scale attack uh on ukraine and it didn't stop and so it, it started in february 
And it continued. And it still continues. Uh, not so, in, not as intensive in Kiev or around Kiev because Russian uh, troops uh, pulled out of that area. But the very, at the very beginning, I mean, uh, they occupied uh, close to 20% of the Ukrainian territories, and we were, our biggest fear was that they're going to surround the Kiev entirely, and then we don't have any food supplies mm -hmm. or any you know, commercial supplies coming into Kiev. So that was the biggest fear. And also then we had uh, some relatives with us uh, staying in Kiev, working in Kiev, uh, like uh, my sister-in-law, she was pregnant and they were expecting a baby that very month. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were ready. I mean, they've done some appointments with doctors and they've decided on the hospital and they had the doctor appointed for them and uh, things were going well for them. And then all of a sudden there's the war and there's lots of fear and not understanding and, and panicking even. I mean, how do you, where do you go? How do you do this? You know. So we went to the basement. We went to the shelter. There was another single mother who was uh, uh, in Kiev at the time, the family that we ministered to. Uh, she somehow arranged for us to stay in the, uh, in the f uh, sports center, which was two levels under the ground. And so we went there and we literally slept on the floor in a sport gym and it was our bomb shelter and uh, there was, uh, at, at the time, there was 200 people living with us in the same bolster. And all of a sudden we had this community of people who are just staying there for the curfew hours because sometimes the curfew would be from evening till morning but sometimes we would have a curfew running from Friday uh, night till Monday morning. So you're living with a group of other people who are just like you, who just happen to be in Kiev, uh, mostly uh, people that just happen to be in very difficult life situations, uh, people with disabilities, a lot of elderly people, a lot of students who were cut off th from their homes or towns or from their villages, uh, who, j who, who were just waiting like us, uh, hoping for all this craziness and madness to finish quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stayed there for, t for 10 days, and uh, we would stay during the night, we would stay in the, um, in the shelter and then in the morning we would get out because all of a sudden people would, uh, people started writing to us and saying, I have mm. an uncle uh, who just went through the heart attack, can you go and check on him? Someone would mm. write to me and say, I have a sister with four kids, she's left without food, can you give her some food? And someone would write to us and say, we have someone who just delivered the baby, a family, and they need diapers and there's no place mm. for them to buy it. So we would go out. Uh, because we had the car and during the daytime we would go out and try to buy supplies and buy food and buy medications for people and try to deliver it to all these addresses and at first it was going well but then it as as the Ukrainian uh, government as Ukrainian officials were building more and more roadblocks it was delivering food even within Kiev was getting more and more mm. difficult where I can travel from one side of Kiev to another side of Kiev within like 20 minutes because at some point there was no cars at all. Then later it, t it took us four hours to get from one side of Kiev to another side of Kiev because there's a river in the middle and the bridges that were functioning before were closed. We were down to only two bridges and so that's when we decided to move out of Kiev and, and go to Vinitsa because uh, during the war my wife was in terrible stress. For the first three days of war she was just crying flat oh, uh, for I, the first three days. I, I and, then, and then we would get out and try to do some good. And as soon as it was getting dark, she would tell me, let's go to the shelter, let's go to the right. shelter, let's go to the shelter. So we had to kind of wrap everything uh, we're doing and go to the shelter so that she can have a little bit of peace of mind, you know. And, and so later I evacuated her to Vinica and then that opened me more opportunities to start traveling and, and getting evacuating people out of Kiev and then getting supplies and taking them in Kiev. So here you are, residents having to deal with this, but you're also a pastor. Mm -hmm. So from a faith standpoint, suddenly you have a whole mission field right there mm -hmm. in front of you. Mm -hmm. People who are in true need of the love of Jesus. No, and it's not only that. The reason why we're helping is, like I said, at first, uh, People who had means, people who had resources, like people that had car, had gas, and have money available, they immediately left Kiev. And uh, it's a very typical situation when the, when the people with means or people with money, they leave, who's staying behind? Well, people who are staying behind are typically people who, 
who don't have means, who, people that don't have cars, people that don't have the finances, uh, people uh, like uh, single mothers or, or uh, people who were left behind by their relatives or friends or people that just happened to be in this time where they just lost a job before the war and so they are going through the difficult financial state and they cannot leave because they simply don't have the resources or don't have any friends or anyone to help them. And so all of a sudden you have a lot of people, and I mean millions of people because mm -hmm. Kyiv is a huge city. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the city, the Kyiv proper is around 3 million, but then the, the big city with all the satellite cities is more than 6 million population. And all of a sudden it's all down to maybe 1 million, so a lot of people evacuated and then you have a lot of people in need or people who are going through the difficult time or, or financial struggles and they need help all of a sudden so you need church to help them you need church to be church to the people so has the ukraine nazarene compassionate ministry stepped in at this time and mm -hmm. be able to do that food compassion uh finances a uh, resource how how are, how is how is that aspect of your ministry just stepping up and so important right now. Uh, well, it's uh, when the when we had a meeting and uh, talk with my leader. Uh, it wasn't. They asked. They said, uh, Andre, of all the people and pastors that we have from Nazarene Church in the area, you are the most experienced in Nazarene Compassion Ministry. So you're probably the the only one that knows a lot because I've been working with them before that. And uh, would you would you help? That's literally what they asked me. Would you help? And I said, mm -hmm. yes, I can do that. Uh, I can help because I know how it's supposed to work. Uh, but it wasn't like I was given an office, you know, and a mm -hmm. hat and then, you know, <laughs> Nazarene Compassion and T-shirt <laughs> and a safe full of money. It wasn't uh, like that. Yes. At, at first it was, we just need someone to start coordinating with us. Someone that would uh, coordinate with local pastors and the community and, and just to think how we can be more effective helpful on the ground and starting from that we would develop the relationship to where later on we received an invitation of a cargo van and then a Dutch district uh, of the Church of Nazarene they did a whole fundraiser and so they bought a vehicle the the van that we were later using for evacuating people out of uh, Kiev and uh, taking food back into Kiev so it was uh, on my side it was just a decision to be helpful to people stay with the people and uh, and then uh, just go out to all these other churches, denominations, and organizations and start knocking on the doors and asking them to help us help people in Kiev. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we were doing it. And we'll first. talk about it in a moment because the fact who you are in the United States because mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to help as well. But I, I, I looked on your Facebook page and I saw um, pictures and videos that you posted and I saw a lot of destruction. I mean, mm -hmm. ruined buildings, bombed out buses, um, people's lives in despair because everything that they had that was trustworthy has just been gone. Mm -hmm. It's just gone. Yeah all of a sudden and it's even more difficult for Ukrainians because uh, the the typical lifestyle in Ukraine is that you're born in the same city and then you go to school in the same city and then you go and find work in the same city and you go and you retire in the same city and you pretty much stay in the whole house your entire life you know and uh, very often it's uh, for example your granddad who bought the land and it's your father who started building the house and then you're building the house for your children hoping that your grandchildren will still be living in the same property mm -hmm. in the same house and now imagine that when the war comes you are suddenly forced to make a decision which is not your decision because you're not moving closer to job and you are not upgrading the house you know you're just forced uh, to leave your house because otherwise you can get uh, into the military zone or you can get into the active uh, bombing area mm -hmm. and you can become a target or the victim or casualty and so f a lot of people were faced with this uh, need to evacuate but very few people wanted to because mm -hmm no matter how hard it is and no matter how, how, how scary it was for some people, for them it was their home, you yes. know, something to hold on to. And we still have, uh, we still have people, it may sound uh, irrational, but we still have some people who are still living in their own basements and homes. They don't want to live. But I also understand them because some of the people, when I ask them, why don't you live? Why don't you let our military do the work and then you come back later? And they say, well, uh, in many cases they are saying we don't have anyone to go to especially if talking about the 
elderly people, like we don't have any relatives. Our kids don't want us or our kids are living too far away. We won't be able to make it there. Uh, some, and some people, like they say, okay, if we go to, if we go to Lviv, for example, Lviv, Lviv is overcrowded. Lviv was receiving refugees, but then at one point when the, the city of Lviv, which is in the western part of Ukraine, they received more than 200,000 refugees. The mayor of the city said, I mean, we love you, but please mm -hmm. go, go to other cities. Mm -hmm. We are physically mm -hmm. unable to process that many refugees. So all these cities, they were overcrowded with refugees. And uh, some people wanted to go outside. But the question is, is, it's the same question. I go to Poland, or I go to Hungary, or I go to Germany, I go to England, all these other countries. There's a language I don't understand. There's mm -hmm. a culture I don't understand. Uh, I may be too old to start looking for a new job or for the opportunities. Who will be there to meet us? I mean, who will help us? At least here, we have some neighbors or we have some childhood friends. Someone may be able to help us here as long as we stay in our own apartment. But if we go out there, who's there for us? And, and some people are scared to death, like my parents. They live in Kherson. Kherson is currently occupied uh, by Russian troops. And uh, I, I talked to my dad uh, many times, asking him to take my mom and get out of Kherson. And he's, he's saying, no, I will not mm -hmm. live. This is my home. Hmm. This is my home. This hmm. is what I've been working for my whole life. Yeah. And uh, if I die, I might just as well die in my own home. Mm. You know, and that's <laughs> just some people like that. Yeah. So how can we here in the United States, what can we best do to be a help? Uh, uh, there's many ways how, how people can help, especially if we're talking about people from the church, because there's, there's many opportunities like through and Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. Uh, uh, they are able to transfer money to Ukraine to the pastors. That what, that's what has been happening. We were able to buy some food in Poland and then transport stuff all the way, like food and hygiene items from Poland into Ukraine. We had people, uh, some volunteers from the United States, uh, from Texas, people that I don't even know about. They just messaged me and they said, hey, Andre, we want to help with this group of guys. We were supposed to go in Ukraine with another organization, but we're now in Hungary and we're willing to buy several truckloads full of uh, supplies, food. Would you be willing to come and take them? And I would say yes. So I would go to the border and collect it and mm -hmm. transport with, within the Ukrainian ter Ukraine's territory. So there's NCM is one of the channels how how we're how our Nazarene churches can uh, support. And it's not only the support is not only going to Nazarene churches. I mean, we focus on our churches, but we really help all this other charismatic mm -hmm. and Baptist and uh, uh, other churches, denominations, uh, Christians, non-Christians, doesn't matter. People who are in need and people that need support, we're able to help them through that. Uh, some churches here are doing crisis care kits. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about them or not, but it's a basic set of uh, hygiene items like shampoo, tooth, toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, some soap, uh, some other hygiene items. And uh, that's like gold to some of the refugees mm -hmm. because you think about the situation mm -hmm. where you have to run for your life. And sometimes people People would run in what they had on them and sometimes people those who are able to carry something they would prefer to take kids over the suitcases and so you have sometimes the family like the mother three kids and uh, the only small backpacks for children a small small little suitcase full of the like first necessary items so when they cross the border uh, you know or when they get to this new towns or cities when we are able to give them the stuff that they were not able to carry with them physically it's a uh, it's very important and mm -hmm. significant and also uh, you need to remember that the winter is coming the winter is coming mm -hmm. and so i know like uh, one of the church here in the united states they do a collection of winter clothes that they're then willing to send to poland and then from poland we'll be able to take it if within ukraine territory that's pressures, and uh, that would be a huge need. We're looking at winter. Some cities and some locations don't have gas. They don't have electricity. Some locations don't have a drinking water. So I know organizations and churches that are providing filters so that people can, can have uh, access to fresh water. Some organizations are even going in and helping people do the wells so that they can have water. But uh, that would be uh, a big need, even if the war stops today. Uh, the results of the war, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the the destruction that we had from mm -hmm. the war, the broken economy uh, as a result of the war, that would have a yeah. long impact. And so help will be needed, not not now, and probably even, I mean, several months from now, the help would still be needed. 
It's impossible to predict the future, but do you have any thoughts on what is going to happen in the coming weeks and months? Do you expect the war to continue? Do you think negotiations will bring things to an end? Mm. Or do you just know by being there, what we hear in the United States might only be a small portion of the real story? Uh, I, I don't have any comments about that. I, uh, as a person, I feel that uh, right now it's a battle of will and resolve and Ukraine has a lot of resolve to clear the whole territory, regain the whole ter territory, uh, because as an independent state, we should be able to be our own state, and uh, we don't need any neighbors to tell us how to do things within our own country. And I think it's only fair that Ukraine is fighting for its freedom, Ukraine is fighting for its independence. But on the other side, we have Russia, uh, which is a big territory, and they have a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of resources to continue this war for as long as they need to. So uh, I think we're for a long um, standoff between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, there's no signs of this ending anytime soon. But we still serve a great God yes. that we can trust yes. through all of this. Yes, that's uh, we we as and it's amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, as the believers, I've never seen such a unity between different churches in denominations mm -hmm. as it's happening right now during a time of war. Um, and it just pleases me, you know, that we finally, as a church, as the body of Christ, we're able to set aside or all of our theological uh, differences, mm -hmm. all our, mm -hmm. you know, arguments to the right. side and say, let's focus on the need in front of us. We have a war. We have a lot of people that need support, that need help. They need Christ and they need churches to be churches. They need Christians to, to have compassion and mercy, go in and do something united for the benefit of the church within Ukraine. And it's just amazing to see how the body of Christ can work together uh, when it's not divided by, by all these barriers that we sometimes have in a peaceful life. In the darkest moments, the Christ's light can sure, surely shine the brightest. All right. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy United States schedule to talk with us. And we will keep praying and encourage all of you to do the same. And if it's on your heart to support, the website is there on the screen. Um, continue to pray for him and his wife as they continue to do what they're doing here. And then eventually we'll head back over to your country. Thank you very much for having us. Thank it's you. our pleasure.